So we're going to talk about content security policies, which is, I think, a fascinating um, approach to security, but of course, it's also incredibly geeky and nerdy. So um, I hope you guys find it interesting on some level. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Was this working? No. OK. Fingers it is. Yeah, so I founded a WordPress development agency based out of Jerusalem, Israel. Um, and I did that for uh, about 12 years. And we worked with leading tech companies and universities, nonprofits in Israel. Um, wrote a blog that was widely read, but stopped blogging, which I'm sad about. I don't. I mostly post on Facebook, if anything, or Twitter, and no more long blog posts. But um, I used to do that pretty, pretty well. Uh, and a lot of the tips there were followed by people in the WordPress community. I basically documented my WordPress discovery journey. I thought, if people helped me, that's how I learned, right? In the WordPress community, from other people's posts, I'm going to write what I learned, and then hopefully that can help others. So um, yeah, so I, I wrote that for a while and uh, organized WordCamp five times in Israel until they made a policy that you can be the lead organizer up to two times. Um, so I kind of surpassed that. <laughs> and it was actually really good timing because I really needed a break. Like organizing it five times is a bit much. Uh, someone else was supposed to take it over. It didn't really happen. So hopefully we've restarted the WordPress community meetups in Jerusalem. Uh, we were having monthly meetups, which is great. And hopefully we're going to do a WordCamp in 2019. So stay tuned if you want an opportunity or an excuse to come visit Israel. And, that, and then, oh, oops, and since then I founded a startup called Stratic, uh, serverless and static publishing for WordPress. I can tell you more about that. And here are my other seven startups. Yes, I have seven children. <laughs> yeah, and they're the joys of my life. So anyways, that's about me. So what happens when you load a web page? What happens is that the browser identifies what it should be loading into the browser and displaying. And that can include a lot of assets that aren't necessarily on the server with the website. Um, some of them are, some of them aren't, some of them are loading from different domains, et cetera. And what you will see is that if you look at the page source of a lot of websites, this is um, a very prominent new site, they will be loading assets from all different sources. Um, and you can see here, you know, Bounce Exchange, Adobe, Amazon, uh, et cetera. And a recent study showed that on average, websites are loading 42 scripts that are external um, at any given time. So we're depending a lot on third-party services and third-party scripts in order to make our web pages functional. And over 50% of all page requests are third-party calls. So without us really noticing, we're adding more and more to our websites that we don't actually really have control over. Uh, there's a big trust factor here, but it's just so easy. You just insert a JavaScript um, you know, piece, and you're good to go, and you've got some new functionality or new tracking. Um, and, and that's what we're all doing to our websites, including the very large ones. How do web apps get compromised? So first of all, it can be on the server side, which is like uh, SQL injections, which target the entire website, right? And um, it will compromise the files or the database. And that's 76% of, of total exploits are that kind of attack. The other kind is on the client side. Um, and those are called cross-site scripting attacks. And um, cross-site scripting attacks are kind of the oldest uh, method of compromising a website. They've been around basically since the dawn of the internet. Um, and it's one of the most widespread. You would think that if it's been around for so long, it would be less of a threat. But that's not how the internet works, necessarily. Um, there's constant efforts to try to mitigate it. But it still continues to be a very serious threat. Um, what it does is it allows an attacker to run a script in the user's browser. Um, and the browser can't tell the difference between a script that is authorized to run and a script that is malicious. So this is what happens. A uh, browser loads all the assets, including this terrible, evil JavaScript. And the browser accepts it and runs it. And then it can do all sorts of terrible things to the site. And because it's uh, to the user, actually. And because it's accepted in the browser, it actually has the same permissions and access um, as the browser has. So cookies, web storage, you know, forms, the DOM, it's all got the same permissions um, as, as the site itself. It's been in the OWASP um, top 10 forever. It's now in position 7. Um, 
And it's the second most prevalent issue. Uh, it's found in two thirds of all applications. You know, at any given time, huge amounts of websites have uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability. So with cross-site scripting, the, unlike the server-based type of attack where it modifies something on the server or the database or the files, here the victim is actually the visitor of the website. Um, and here are just some of the things that can be done to a visitor to a website like this. Session hijacking, cookie theft, account takeover, redirecting traffic, um, stealing account credentials, displaying unwanted ads, virus and malware infections, key logging, et cetera. So lots of fun stuff. And these are things that we definitely want to be preventing so that our, our visitors can safely browse our websites. Um, one example of a recent attack like this that used a third-party service to um, infiltrate websites was a, a hack called the Browse Aloud. So Browse Aloud is an add-on that a lot of British government websites added to their sites. Um, it's an accessibility add-on. It's text-to-speech. So that's very useful and nice and good for a government for trying to make their sites more accessible. In Israel, that is not the case, so that's great. But um, what happened was the sites are all loading this third-party script, um, which they trusted. And then the script was uh, modified by hackers. And all of those sites, instead of being text-to-speech um, accessible, became crypto miners. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and you're talking about um, how many sites was it? Let's see. Thousands. Thousands, over 5,000 sites. Um, got this vulnerability and were mining um, cryptocurrency when visitors, uh, using visitors' CPU and resources when they were visiting these British government websites. So that's just one example. Why is that bad? Okay, crypto mining, like whatever, because it slows, slows down the devices. It can take CPU to higher levels. Um, if you're anything like me, you might have a lot of browser tabs open, so you can't afford to have your CPUs anymore. <laughs> um, battery drain, overheating, um, you know, uh, puts a load on your, on your device, et cetera. So, um, and of course, a government should not be mining <laughs> cryptocurrency. Um, we had that actually in the WordPress community. There was a, a weather widget that was in the plugin repository, and the person who developed it didn't realize that the uh, resource that they were using to display the weather was also crypto mining, um, yeah. Thing. So that's an, another example. But the very biggest, most significant type of attack um, is the Magikarp one. Um, it's very interesting um, and very uh, widespread. So basically, Magikarp um, has been going on for the last three years. It took a really long time for anyone to realize that this was happening. And it's a group that nobody really knows who they are. Um, and what they do is they identify third-party scripts or services that websites are using, and then they hack those. So at first, when Magikarp started out, they would actually hack direct the site directly. But then they came up with this approach where they would identify a tool that was maybe easier to uh, hack, and then they would hack that, and then they were able to apply their hack to the sites that had that script installed on it. So these are just some examples. Um, and what they did was they became credit card skimmers. So when people would fill in a credit card form on any of these sites, they were able to grab the credit card information and, of course, use it for malicious purposes. Um, and they, it's estimated that thousands, I think thousands of sites have been affected by Magikarp. And um, it's really hard to track because they're very smart. They, uh, in, they modify the script in a way that looks like it's meant to be there. It's, so it's, it's difficult to, to identify it. OK, so that brings us to content security policies. Um, the idea behind content security policies is that, uh, OK, so we're in this world of the web where we're all installing who knows what on our sites. Um, I'm guilty of that, too. Just two days ago, I found a shiny new tracker thingy, and I installed it on our site. And then I was trying to debug it. I was like, why isn't it working? And I was like, oh, right, because we have a content security policy that's not allowing me to be irresponsible. Good. <laughs> so what it does is basically you, um, you whitelist sources that you have deemed to be trustworthy and OK to load on your site. And then anything that's not that will get blocked by the browser. So um, it's, a, it's a header that talks to the browser. And um, the modern browsers 
except for, of course, Microsoft. Microsoft has partial support. Uh, they all support the content security policy header, and they will respect it. And so uh, it will load whatever you say that it can load when the, view the viewer loads the web page, and it will block anything else. So um, basically, the way that it works is, OK, I'm loading a web page, and I've authorized Google Fonts. I've authorized Google Analytics. I've authorized my own images. And then I have not authorized this other resource, and the content security policy won't allow it to load. And if these websites had had content security policies uh, properly implemented, Magicart would not have been possible. So in terms of browser support levels, there's a really useful site called Can I Use? Uh, if you're ever wondering what is supported in browsers in general, um, and you can check out which browsers support content security policies and which version. This is, these are, this is the support for content security policy level two, but in October-ish, yeah, October, level three was rolled out. But Chrome and Firefox um, support it. You know, Safari 2, I think. Of course, Microsoft always lags behind. So how does, content, how, do, like, how does the content security policy work? What do you have to do in order to create one and implement it on your site? So there's two parts to it. There's the directives, which are the type of assets that you want to limit or control. So you can tell by their names kind of what they are, you know, fonts, um, frames, like iframes, images, media. Media is like video and um, objects. Objects are flash type of content. Um, scripts, which is JavaScript. Styles, which are, of course, style, CSS. And then you say, OK, now for this font, for the fonts, I, will only, I only want the site to load fonts from, let's say, my website, or not at all, right? Like uh, for the, the object source, a lot of content security policies will say none, because you don't want any iframes loading. Those, are, those tend to be a pretty popular way to uh, breach a site. Um, self, self is my own domain. <coughs> so anything that's sitting on, let's say, my, mysite.com slash whatever, then that's accepted. Um, stars, a wild card. Use that carefully. Um, and unsafe inline, unsafe eval, which I'm going to talk about. So this is the default content security policy. So when you start out, um, you could do content security policy default source none. And that's a good way to actually try to identify through the console. And I'll show you how, what assets are trying to be loaded. And then you can say, OK, this, I need to whitelist this. I need to whitelist that. Um, or you could start with self, because it's probably the case that you do want to load assets from your own domain. Um, what this actually means, the default source, is it covers these directives um, and, they, and makes them all self. Okay? It used to be that it didn't cover everything, but now I think it pretty much covers um, all of the directives. So you've covered that and you said, okay, those are all self. And then you can tweak it further. So you can say, okay, self for the script source, um, but also I want Google Analytics to work. So I need to authorize that with a, by whitelisting it. Fonts, same. Um, object source, like I mentioned, probably best to do none, unless for some reason iframes are important. You can also, by the way, tweak it so that on a per page basis, it will accept things. So if you know you have an iframe on one page, you can have a different um, security header on that page. It doesn't have to be site-wide. Um, this is my favorite <laughs> content security policy uh, directive. Uh, basically, what it does is if you uh, have a site and has mixed content, right? Now that we all need to have HTTPS on our sites, um, and it's very important, um, you might end up having a, a site, a legacy site, or whatever, a migration that didn't go 100% smoothly, and it still has some assets that are HTTP, like an image or who knows what. Um, and then you won't have the padlock on that page, which is very sad. So this, instead of going and finding it all, which you can do, it says load all assets as HTTPS, even if they're HTTP. So it's like a one-step HTTPS for everything um, directive, and it's 100% effective. So it's, it's great. So that gets a big emoji from me. <laughs> um, uh, defaults for the, oh, right, the reporting, sorry. OK, so um, what's really useful about the content security policy is that uh, there's an understanding that uh, websites are dynamic, they change, we add things, we remove things, and um, it's really hard to keep track of it, especially as the site gets larger. So there's a reporting capability where you can have this directive and it will collect information about 
violations of your content security policy. Now, violations don't necessarily mean that someone's trying to hack you. It might mean, you know, you now have a YouTube video embedded in your site and you haven't authorized that. You haven't whitelisted it. And so it's violating the content security policy and then you can whitelist it and then your YouTube video will now appear on your site. So, and then what it does is it collects the data and sends it as a JSON to the URL that you define. So here it could be CSP reports or something like that. If you start to do research about content security policies online, the problem is that there's not a lot of information out there and some of it's outdated. Even though they've been around since 2012, um, they're not widely used, they're, people aren't really familiar with it, and the documentation, well, there's the standard documentation from the W3C, but that documentation is never, ever legible. I don't know if you've ever tried to read the documentation, but it's the worst. You just go in circles and like they use English, <laughs> like I don't know who's writing it, but um, Google has some really good documentation, but even their documentation is not updated to CSP level three in some places. So what you might find is some mentions of these directives, and is that six hours? <laughs> okay, um, some CSP uh, directives that look like this, the X ones, and um, they are no longer supported. Supported, but you might see uh, document like. Uh, tutorials or whatever that will say use it, don't use it. Okay, but the irony is that even after you've whitelisted everything, all of us are going to have inline scripts. Google Analytics is a perfect example. Despite the fact that Google is a huge advocate of CSPs, and the bottom line of CSPs is that your assets need to be an external file and not inline, Google Analytics and other Google tools are inline. Um, and in order to enable that to work, you need to use something called unsafe inline and unsafe eval. Just the names are like, ooh, you're doing terrible things to your site. <laughs> I'm allowing my site to be unsafe. But in order for Google Analytics to actually work, you need to add this, these directives of unsafe inline um, in order for the script to be accepted by the browser. And once you add that, then inline uh, script injections are possible. And Despite all our hard work on the CSPs, our sites are still vulnerable. I gave this talk, first version of it, at WordCamp Europe, and I and we, you know, we implemented this for ourselves and for our clients, and this really bothered me. I was like, so what are we supposed to do? We're all supposed to take our inline assets and and you know make them external. That's a huge job and will take a huge amount of debugging. And and the internet's actually like the way it is, we just this is not built that way. That's a crazy expectation. Other people thought that, obviously. <laughs> um, this is what the directive looks like if you want to have unsafe inline and unsafe eval. So um, one way to get around this is to create a nonce for every script, and, but it has to be randomly generated on every page load. It's not so simple, but um, you have one, and then it's applied to all the scripts that you authorize to load, and um, that can protect you from the inline script because any inline script won't have that randomly generated nonce. It's unguessable. Um, and yeah, so, so that's one solution that, but that came up, but there's a challenge with that, which is caching, right? You can't really cache a page in that case because you have to change it every time. Um, hashes is another thing that you can do, which is you create a hash of the script, the inline script that you want to authorize. Um, so that is, it's that way, if it's, it's changed in any way, then the hash no longer matches the script and then it won't be accepted by the browser. But the problem with that is that if you're using a third-party script, then they're, it's SAS, right? So they're generally updating it. And so then the hash, if they make one update, your, your script's going to stop working. Um, and sub-resource integrity is uh, a way also to say, this is a script, and it's like, this is like a kind of a stamp on it, and it, you know, if, but also it's, it's problematic in terms of maintaining it. So researchers at Google um, identified this, and they took a look at the content security policies that were implemented on like 1.6 million websites. Um, and they found that 94% of them are bypassable because of the issue of the inline um, scripts. So they came up with this directive called script dynamic, um, which on the one hand is not the simplest thing to implement, but on the other hand, it means that it reduces the challenges in a number of ways. So basically, I'll just explain how it works. Um, you, you do the nonce, and they have documentation explaining how to do it, um, random site generator, like random number generators, et cetera. Um, inline event handlers is the most challenging thing here. 
because um, they need to be refactored. And on every page load, right, generate the new nonce. So they're recommending the, the nonce approach. Uh, despite the issue with caching, they don't address that. Um, but basically, what this approach does is it takes everything that I just told you about, which was CSPs until like a few months ago, and says, OK, we don't all have to try to figure out what we need to whitelist, because that's really challenging to keep on top of it. It means consistently analyzing your pages um, and knowing what you've added and adding it to the CSP and doing that properly. Um, and then there's the inline script issue. So no more of that. You create this kind of like one policy um, called strict dynamic. And that applies to everything always. Um, it's kind of like a one step uh, solution to the CSP craziness. Um, and this is like an example of how it looks. So you do the script source, nonce, and then some random uh, number. And that will be the nonce that appears that's like appended to every script on your site that you're OK with. Um, strict dynamic, report sample, whatever. Unsafe inline. The reason unsafe inline is there is for browsers that don't yet support level three of CSP. So then it will be implemented. And then you go back to having at least a CSP with unsafe inline but um, it's better than nothing, um, object source none, et cetera. So um, that's their new like, recommendation about how to implement uh, CSPs. So there is a challenging part of doing the random number. But on the other hand, like I said, it's instead of consistently trying to maintain an update, you just add a random number to all the scripts that you are OK with. And from that point on, you're good to go. Like, it's, just, it, it's much easier. As someone who's been maintaining a CSP for, for us and others, this is much easier. Um, Google has a few tools. Uh, just This is like a cool tool that allows you to see what your browser supports. So um, it's the strict dynamic test bed. And if, when you load it in your browser, if you see these squares, then it means that it supports uh, level the strict dynamic. OK, so how do you add it to your site? So there's um, HTTP headers, right? So you do it on the server level. That's the ideal way to do it. Uh, you can actually do it in your functions.php file. Um, that will work too. And you can also do it with a meta tag. So the meta tag can be useful if you need to do like per page tweaking. Um, it can make it easier. Um, but the meta tag doesn't support some directives, most of them. It doesn't support, I can't remember which ones. But like the most important ones it supports. Oh, here, frame ancestors report UI or sandbox. Uh, you can do it in HT access. Um, yeah, but the most recommended way of doing it is as, a, as an HTTP header that's uh, deployed to the pages on your site. Some tools that can make your life easier. Uh, the console um, in the browser, uh, that is your friend. So if you're ever trying to figure out why something's not working or whatever, go in there and it will, first of all, you can see the content security policy in the console. There's, um, it's under network, right? Yes. Uh, and you can see the whole setup there of your site and any other site. Um, and, and also, it will help you debug, because it will show you very bright red errors if, it's trying to, if something's trying to violate the CSP. This is another tool for checking um, your HTTP response headers. Uh, this is a Google tool. Uh, what it does is it identifies parts of your application which are not compatible with CSP, because that's like the hardest part, uh, figuring out what needs extra loving care. Um, it helps make necessary changes before you deploy your CSP. The CSP evaluator is a very simple tool from Google. You just plug in a URL, and it will say you don't have a CSP, or you do have a CSP. And if you do, it will give you some recommendations. This is like the best and easiest to use tool. Um, it was created by Scott Helm, I think. He's a big security guy. Um, very interesting to read his, his work. Um, so you just plug in a URL. And then you get a report. So this is actually the White House. <laughs> they uh, get a big old red F. <laughs> um, so I'm showing that to you just because A, haha, and B, you can feel better about your own site. Because <laughs> if you have anything better than an F, you're doing better than the White House. <laughs> um, there's some WordPress plugins that will help you uh, manage your CSPs. So uh, it will help you um, create the meta tags. And, and there's some other tools that are useful. Uh, in terms of managing them. Um, some of them haven't been updated for so long, so I don't necessarily recommend using it, but it's an easy way to get started and maybe just start testing it out. Um, this is another one. I'll put this online, and all of these link to the resources and stuff, all these images. This is an amazing tool, the report URI. So they have like a, a wizard 
for creating your CSP. Um, and you just you say, OK, I want this to be self, and this to be this asset, and this to be that asset. And then it gives you something that you can just plug in to your site. And that's really useful. The reason why it's recommended to still have a whitelist is because of the browser compatibility issues. So that way, you know, if it doesn't do the strict uh, dynamic, then you've got the whitelist. Um, this is a great tool, but sadly, it only runs on Windows. Um, it also, it will analyze the page and tell you it like give you like an output of all the, the assets there that you might want to um, whitelist for your CSP. In terms of adoption, so this is from February in the top million websites. Um, only 23,000 have content security policy in it. So you can see that adoption is really low. I mean, there's more by now, but um, it's, it's not growing very quickly. But as front end client side threats and threats like the Magikarp become more prevalent, um, people are going to start implementing it more. And also, with the new approach from the researchers at Google with a strict dynamic, I think it will make it something that's also much more possible for people to implement. So this is a little example of what happens when a site doesn't have a content security policy. Um, I injected something on the front end. I did not hack their site. It was just on my end. But this is just, <laughs> I would not be here, actually. <laughs> I would have been stopped at the border. <laughs> they let me through. <laughs> but um, it's just an example of. Um, like how if you, if you don't have a content security policy, you can actually inject whatever you want into a site. And let's see if this will have sound. Oh, is that? Oh. No. Anyways, um, what happens is I inject the script, and it uh, plays the Harlem Shake. Remember Harlem Shake? <laughs> and then it makes the whole web page dance. It's very entertaining, but well, you'll have to trust me on that. <laughs> That's something I can't really do a demo for. So, um, but anyways, yeah. So uh, that's just an example of how uh, a lack of CSP enables you to inject um, what could potentially be much more malicious um, on a site. So the White House should uh, implement a CSP. I mean, <laughs> they should be a good example, <laughs> at least on that, from that point of view. Um, and I think that was my last slide. So yeah, uh, CSPs for the win. They're crazy, but they make a difference. And um, they're increasingly important. And we're going to see more and more threats on that level. Uh, just one thing that I didn't mention is that it's not, it doesn't prevent the cross-site scripting. What it is, it's, uh, it's called defense in depth. It's like another layer. So what it is is if your site is breached, because cross-site scripting is so difficult to uh, identify and control, you've got this extra level. and um, and then it will protect your users, and then uh, like protect your brand, um, protect yourself from being sued <laughs> for credentials being stolen, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I think this is kind of part of the future of where the internet's going. And it's very interesting. And it's worth keeping an eye on it. And I hope that was helpful to you. And if anyone wants to see the video later, I'm happy to show you <laughs> the White House do the Harlem Shake. So thank you. <laughs> We've got a couple of minutes for questions, so um, who's got them? Uh, coming. Does the content security policy actually prevent the types of problems that you were talking about with the, you know, a script, a script that's being loaded from a third party changing without my knowledge? Right, yeah. So um, if the script is changing, in order for them to inject into your site, they would have to know what the nonce is. Um, and they can't. It, because if it's set up properly, it's randomly generated. Um, it should be long enough and complex enough, and et cetera. But um, you know, it's unguessable. So, so it prevents that. And if they try to inject anything, that's for something that exists. And if it doesn't exist yet on your site, then also there's no nonce there that matches the header. So nothing, they can't, they can't do anything. So the nonce is generated in the head yeah. and in the HTML. So that's, like, in, in my opinion, the next thing that has to be tackled because we want to be caching things, right? And to have to like, generate a new page load on every visit, it's resource intensive, slow, et cetera. It's like, that's not where we want to go. But um, I imagine that there's going to be fixes for that because the internet isn't a place of caching today. You can't, you can't work that way. But in the meantime, that's, that's how it is, yeah. 
Any other questions? Yeah. Me first. Uh, how important is this for the average, you know, user's website versus uh, a larger organization that's probably taking data from people? So, like everything with regards to security, you have to do the pros and cons. Like, is it worth it for me to invest the time? How big is the threat? Um, it's possible that on small websites, it's not so critical. But as it gets easier to do, it's kind of like HTTPS, right? Like, how critical is HTTPS for a small website? It's critical. And, um, you know, we should be making every effort to protect our users also. Um, so, yeah, it's like, it's a pain but it's definitely worth keeping in mind. And I do think it will become easier to implement because it has to. It has to be something that we all can basically implement as easily as possible. And that's generally how things go. So um, yeah, it's like you have to do the cost benefit analysis for yourself. But anyone who's doing transactions of any kind or even capturing user information in some way through a form probably should be doing that. Uh, thanks, Miriam. Great talk. Um, I wanted to ask and build on the other person's question who asked about uh, if the script changes without your knowledge. Um, maybe not so concerning if it's like Google Analytics and you probably trust the code they're pushing onto your site. But if you've got third-party scripts from developers that maybe, you know, they, you know, stop developing the project and or they somehow get into malicious hands, is there anything that content security policies can do to help with that? Or is there anything that you would recommend to be able to know if that's happening? Well, if you've implemented the content security policy and the script gets into malicious hands, then they can't do what they want to do. Because, again, it comes back to the nonce and it not being there, and so any changes that they make won't be accepted by the browser. So the functionality will stop working altogether, um, but that's better than you know, malicious activity. So yeah, no problem. Hi, good morning. Thank you morning. for your talk. Um, my interest is, is with uh, Apache or Nginx, how is that implemented at the server level? If you could speak about that a little bit. So that's like, you probably need web developers to do that. It's um, different for each one, and it's how you would manage your HTTP headers. So it's, it's, it's on the server level. It's not like something that can be easily explained right here. <laughs> In the back. Thank you for the information. So when you're writing your rule set for this, I saw you had like seven different um, images, videos, whatever. Do you have to write a new rule for each content that you want to protect or can you combine it all into a single rule? And if you have to write multiple, is that resource intensive at all to the user's browser? So there's two sides to it. There's the one side which is um, if you don't, if you have a content security policy and let's say it says it's self, then like a YouTube video won't work. So if you want functionality to work on your site, then you have to create a directive for it. Um, and that's, that's from that point of view of just enabling functionality to even work. Um, if you do a content security policy that's too broad and allows everything, then you might as well not have one, you know? Um, so <laughs> um, I'm not sure if that answers your questions, but like it's like, if you have one, you need to auth whitelist uh, assets if you want them to work. Um, and then the bad stuff won't work because it's not authorized. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. <laughs> oh, so it depends on your use case, like, and also how much you want to protect it. Like, let's say object source, which is um, Flash and stuff, you should probably just put in uh, none just to you know be safe. Um, and it depends how much you care. Like, let's say the fonts. You could say only, let's say, Google fonts if that's what you're loading, or you could just leave it. And then, theoretically, it could load a malicious font, but, you know, is that going to happen? I don't know. Um, you don't have to define them all. And that default source, if you do default source self, then that covers everything, more or less, in terms of saying anything coming from my domain is OK. Uh, but then again, if you add something that's not from your domain and you want it to work, then you're going to have to uh, tweak the related, the relevant directive for that. Yep. Come on. Thank you for the talk. Uh, the plugin that you mentioned, does it have, uh, does that add the nonces that you were talking about? No. So that doesn't exist yet in an easy way. Um, yeah, unfortunately. It's also relatively new and these are kind of old and not so well maintained, the plugins. 
Incidentally, there will be a hacker day on Sunday if anyone wants to try adding it in. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Hands high, please. Okay. Thank you, Miriam. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.